Hi there, Jordan Carroll here. Today we're going to talk about Friedrich Kittler, introducing his most influential concept, the discourse network. Kittler was a German media theorist who brought together French post-structuralism with a careful attention to the materiality of media. He is best known for books such as Discourse Networks, 1800-1900, and Gramophone Film Typewriter. For reasons of time, this lecture assumes some familiarity with post-structuralism, including allusions to Foucault, Lacan, and Derrida. You might want to pause the lecture and look up some of these authors if you aren't aware of them. Kittler was heavily indebted to Michel Foucault, especially his theories of discourse. Like Foucault, Kittler seeks to find the rules governing what can be known and spoken. Unlike Foucault, however, Kittler sees media history as the ultimate framework for discourse. Quote, media determine our situation. End quote. That is to say, nothing in discourse can be communicated that can't be recorded and transmitted by the media we have. Because of this, Kittler thinks Foucault has a problem. Foucault focuses on textual archives. He looks at diagrams, tables, pictures, writing, and so on. And as a result, he seems to take media technology for granted. He's interested in statements, but not in how statements are inscribed and circulated. This leads to a crucial blind spot in Foucault's work. His analysis deals primarily with discourses that came prior to the invention of technical media. Technical media include the camera, the phonograph, and film. According to Kittler, quote, unlike writing, technical media do not utilize the code of a workaday language. They make use of physical processes which are faster than human perception. Let's look at an example that shows why this matters. Unlike writing, photography doesn't obey social rules for speech. It doesn't have the same biases and limitations as a speaker. Photography brings to light sub-perceptual phenomena that we were previously ignorant of. As Walter Benjamin suggests, it is through the camera that we first discover the optical unconscious, just as we discover the instinctual unconscious through psychoanalysis. When media begin to show us things that we never could have described or known, language and human cognition begin to take a back seat to purely technical processes. This leads Killer to supplement Foucault's concept of discourse with the discourse network. Discourse networks consist of all the technologies and institutions that allow a given culture to select, store, and produce relevant data. Discourse networks include not only physical media, but also a wide range of organizations, such as universities, postal systems, state, and the state bureaucracy. Killer derives this term from Judge Daniel Schrieber, a schizophrenic best known as the subject of a study by Freud. As Killer suggests, madness offers special insight into the workings of media technology. Foucault presents shifts in discourse as largely unexplained ruptures in history. Kittler, however, posits that these changes came about as a result of the invention of new media. Let's look at one of his discourse networks, Discourse Network 1800. Discourse Network 1800 was characterized by a monopoly of print media. There were no other channels of communication. Sights and sounds had to be hallucinated by the reader. As a result, Discourse Network 1800 was dedicated to creating a fantasy of immediacy and presence. All of the events in the book seemed to be right there with the reader in the library. Here we can see the influence of Derrida's of grammatology. The difference, however, is that Kittler locates the metaphysics of presence at a particular moment in history, one that has long since been superseded. In his early career, Kittler focused on German sources, and with Discourse Network 1800, he was primarily interested in Romantic figures such as Goethe. Romantic authors and readers consistently misrecognized written language as oral. This fantasy recalled their shared experience of learning the alphabet using the phonetic method, listening to their mother's voices. Idealized woman or nature thus became the inspiration and the audience for all literature. Romantic male poets reinterpreted the supposedly preliterate and prelinguistic voice of Mother Nature. They translated it into literary language and then transmitted it back to an audience largely made up of women. These women, in turn, were prepared to pass on their teachings to the next generation, a perfect circuit. Thus, poets listened for a primordial voice before written language, an inner voice that served as the transcendental signified. The transcendental signified is pure presence, originary orality, an inarticulate voice 
that transcends the uncertainties of interpretation as well as the vicissitudes of meaning, one that was outside the play of language. The conscience of the autonomous subject thus replaced God as a guarantor of meaning. Here, the subject exists only insofar as it serves the purpose of translating between print media and what can't be printed, translating the words on the page into sound, images, and meaning became a pleasurable communion with the memory of a maternal caregiver. This all begins to change with Discourse Network 1900. During this period, technical media break writing's monopoly on discourse. Thanks to new media capabilities, we no longer live in a world filled with meaning. Discourse now includes truly random patterns. During the same period, neuroscience or psychophysics discovers that the brain is itself a physical medium one that is divided up into separate functions. An injury into part of the brain that recognizes characters, for example, might not impede speech. Research into neurological phenomena such as aphasia and alexia thus reveals that there's no internal harmony between language, speech, and thought. The human subject begins to look more like a machine with many competing subcomponents. To quote from one of Hitler's favorite songs, Brain Damage by Pink Floyd, there's someone in my head, but it's not me. Thanks to new technical media, poets and readers no longer need to translate pre-linguistic material into language. Rendered obsolete, the unitary subject disintegrates. The three functions once contained in written discourse, voice, image, and text, split into three media functions, gramophone, film, and typewriter. These three match Lacan's triad, the real, the imaginary order, and the symbolic order. Here we can clearly see Kittler's break with media theorists such as Marshall McLuhan. McLuhan imagined media as extensions of man, but Kittler thinks of man as an extension of media. Even the human psyche is carved up into different media apparatuses. Let's start with the gramophone. The gramophone maps onto Lacan's concept of the real. Lacan defines the real as the thing in itself, the world before any absence or gaps, a plenitude or fullness that has not been carved up into signifiers or categories. As such, the real can never be re represented through language or image, because language depends on difference or lack, while images always cut the world up into separate subjects and objects, dividing the self and the other. The real is associated with the child's initial union with the mother, one that is simultaneously sublime, overwhelming, and ever sought after. Whereas print media could only record discrete signifiers, gramophones were capable of capturing continuous sounds, including noise. Indeed, Freud compares the ideal psychoanalyst to a phonograph, taking in and recording the gibberish of a patient with perfect fidelity. Now that women's voices can be recorded on vinyl, they no longer stand in for the transcendental signified. There is no anchor for meaning outside of discourse. Film maps onto Lacan's concept of the imaginary. The imaginary order is established during the mirror stage. The infant experiences herself as a series of disconnected and fragmented parts, a bundle of incoherent and contradictory impulses and desires. The infant is in a state of what Lacan calls, quote, motor impotence and nursling dependence, end quote. The infant longs for the self-mastery and completeness of adult subjects, and she ultimately finds this in her own image in the mirror. Unlike her inner feelings, the infant she sees in the mirror appears as a discrete and bounded whole. Like the imaginary, film creates the illusion of continuity out of the movement of discrete, still images. Also like the imaginary, film is a realm of dream. And interestingly enough, Lacan produced his idea of the mirror stage after watching films of infants. The typewriter maps onto Lacan's concept of the symbolic. Here, the symbolic order shows the influence of Saussurean linguistics, including the structuralism of Levi-Strauss. Language is revealed as arbitrary and differential. A signifier is only meaningful insofar as it sounds and means something different from other signifiers. It has no inherent meaning. As Kittler suggests, quote, the symbolic encompasses linguistic signs in all their materiality and technicity. That is to say, letters and ciphers form a finite set without taking into account philosophical dreams of infinity. What counts are differences, or, in the language of the typewriter, spaces between the elements of the system. For that reason, Lacan designates the world of the symbolic as the world of the machine." End quote. 
Freed from the hallucination of originary orality, language is reduced to black marks on the page. As Mallarmé suggests, poets no longer work with ideas, as they might have seemed to do in Discourse Network 1800. Instead, they work with words. Moreover, unlike handwriting, the typewriter obliterates all trace of the individual. And finally, the rapidity of typing leads to the experience of automatic writing. Language production becomes faster than the conscious awareness or control of the author. In other words, the typewriter abolishes the romantic myth of the individual author as a creator, revealing language as structural. Kittler hints that we're at the dawning of a new discourse network, Discourse Network 2000. Digital media has now obviated the need for a human audience. Computers can produce, transmit, and receive data all on their own. Furthermore, computers now have a new monopoly on all media. They can provide channels for sights, sounds, and signifiers, as well as computing. As computers link up with one another, they create a unified system, cutting out humans from the communication circuit altogether. Indeed, Kittler suggests that consumer or artistic uses for technical media have always been, in his words, quote unquote, the misuse of military equipment. Kittler argues that the technical media of Discourse Network 1900 emerged from the American Civil War that radio came out of World War I, and digital media came into being during the Second World War. Our ability to listen to music or play games on these devices is only an accidental byproduct. Drawing on Paul Virilio, he suggests that military technology structurally determines our aesthetics. In summation, media provide the technological a priori, or necessary precondition, for discourse. Furthermore, cultural shifts track to changes in media technology. And finally, technical media have spelled the end of humanism. According to Kittler, quote, media are not pseudopods for extending the human body. They follow the logic of escalation that leaves us and written history behind it.